Welcome this evening. Uh, glad you all came out uh, tonight. I think you're in for a real treat. Uh, we have with us tonight uh, Professor Tim Silver from Appalachian State, and uh, who um, some of you I, I see out there have read uh, his first book, A New Face on the Countryside, uh, who had my environmental history class a couple of years ago. Uh, and he's going to be talking about his new book tonight, uh, Mount Mitchell and the Black Mountains. An environmental history of the highest peaks in Eastern America. So uh, I think you're really going to enjoy this. So I give you Professor Silver. Um, thanks, Dan. I always uh, depend on Dan to keep people reading that first book. So, <laughs> um, but I'm really happy to be here, and I want to thank Dan and the history department and um, the other people involved with this for having me over and giving uh, an author a chance to sort of. Uh, talk about his book and, and puff it a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk uh, very informally here and show some slides and try to give you, I hope, a sense of just overall what the book's about and some of the things that I did while writing it. And um, in the end, I, I hope to, to finish in good time so that we can have questions. And I hope you'll have questions when I finish going through the slides and, and talking about the book, because I'll be happy to respond. It's not often that authors get to talk with people other than, uh, than reviewers, and, and sometimes that's dicey, um, with people who've actually read their book or who might read their book. So it's, it's something that we all um, very much look forward to. So I hope you'll, you'll have questions um, about the book or, or about writing it that you'll, that you'll ask. And as I say, I'm going to talk informally and um, talk with some slides, which I hope will come up in good order here. Well, I'm, I'm the author, and this is my subject, is the way I, sh I should introduce this. This is, of course, uh, Mount Mitchell. Uh, and I don't need to tell this audience that it lies in, in the Black Mountains, a 15-mile long range uh, that's shaped vaguely like a fish hook. And uh, for me, um, the Black Mountains are also a, a place that I've regarded um, sort of like a laboratory in doing this book. Not so much uh, a, a biological laboratory, although that's part of it, and um, I'm very interested in the, the kind of um, ecology that's there, but a laboratory in which I can chart and, and hopefully um, narrate interactions between people and nature. And the real theme of the book, the thesis, is, is really quite simple, that a lot of times human actions are defined by the ways in which people perceive themselves in nature and think about themselves in nature, and in fact, the way they define nature. Um, and another key term that we've all been talking about in uh, environmental history over the last few years is wilderness. And so I think another key part of the book is how people see wilderness and how they define that and see themselves in relation to wilderness. So if, if you want to know kind of what the book is about in a sentence or two, it's about what Mount Mitchell has been and what the Black Mountains have been to a lot of different people over time. The book covers about 10,000 years of history. It's a, a very modest uh, approach. Um, from, the, from the end of the Pleistocene to uh, the end of 2002. So it, it really covers a lot of ground, all in about um, 230-odd pages, I think. Um, so. For me, the Black Mountains were, were a kind of laboratory where I could watch a lot of different relationships work out between people and nature because they have been a lot of different things to a lot of different people over time. Um, the, the book is also kind of different for a historian, and this slide is not all that clear. Um, but uh, I tried to write about the Black Mountains at first as if I were a stranger to the region, which is not true. Uh, my family is from that area. I'm 
one of the in-laws was uh, got famous there, Frankie Stewart Silver, for um, murdering her husband, Charlie, who's my relative. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I have a real personal family connection to the Black Mountains in the Mount Mitchell area. They lived along the South Toe River. And some of you know she was convicted of that crime, allegedly, and I want to be careful because there are a lot of stories about that, but allegedly for splitting his skull with an ax and uh, uh, chopping him up and burning his remains and then hiding the ashes in a fireplace and underneath the floor of their cabin in the early 1830s. And she was convicted of the crime and one of the first white women hanged in North Carolina. So homicidal mania uh, runs in the family. Um, but but uh, also, because I had this personal connection, I didn't really want to bring that out initially as a historian because it's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to sort of stand back and write objectively about things and become this all-powerful narrator that takes people around. And I tried that, and um, the first couple of drafts of a chapter that I wrote were just terrible. And uh, so finally I decided rather than to just forego that, I would play up that angle. And uh, that I would try to let myself get personally involved. And so the book is very different from most conventional environmental histories in that it includes uh, entries from a journal I kept while I was doing the research and while I was walking around Mount Mitchell in the Black Mountains. And every chapter revolves around four entries from that journal, expanded entries, that are key to the seasons so that each chapter kind of takes you through a season in the Black Mountains and uh, on Mount Mitchell. And you see what I saw while I was out kind of walking the land. And I now regard that as really important uh, empirical kind of evidence for the book that along with my traditional historian sources from the archives and from um, other folks' work, that I was able to put these together. So um, I said in the preface that professionals would have to accept or at least tolerate my presence in the narrative. And I suppose it'll be less offensive to um, general readers who are used to that kind of thing. But to the slide, um, actually, uh, these were critical tools for doing the book. A pair of hiking boots, a uh, day pack. That's a field guide to eastern forest. You can't really see it in that picture, a camera, and that's also a bottle of insect repellent um, there, which is, is crucial during gnat season um, in, in the Black Mountains. And uh, I have a standing joke that I wore out everything in this slide doing the book. I wore the truck out, uh, I wore the boots out, and I was going to bring those, but they're a little stinky and, and sweaty, so um, they're gone completely. And I wore the camera out making these slides. The field guide is now worn and torn, and the day pack ripped up, so it was a very much a kind of, of personal venture for me uh, to do this. And I followed a lot of trails like these, spent a lot of time um, in, the, in the Black Mountains walking around, just looking at things and trying to make nature come alive um, in the book. The Black Mountains are a place of sometimes stunning beauty. And this is a, a shot of the Cane River Valley on a bright summer day. And uh, the, it's also a place, there are also mountains, though, of many moods. This is made in uh, October um, when the leaves are beginning to turn with a storm rolling in. One of the things I tried to do was to experience the mountains at all seasons. And I'm uh, something of a backpacker and fisherman and camper, particularly a, a winter camper. And so um, I camped in the snow and walked in the snow and the sleet. Even when it was raining sometimes, I went to try to get a sense of what they were like and to try to infuse that into the book. So um, hopefully that, that comes across um, in the book. Well, to the history. Um, I also like to think that this is a book that challenges convention somewhat in, in Appalachian history. And there's no better place to find a conventional view than to look at something the Forest Service posts in the campground. And uh, I like to think that the book kind of challenges every one of these these stereotypes, uh, it begins, the human part of the book begins with um, Native American habitation in the region. I drew a lot of material from the Warren Wilson site and from walking around there and going with the archaeologists there. And it, it, the book paints, I think, an, an up-to-date and a better picture of Indian life in the region than we've had for, for some time. Um, Indian life is very sophisticated, and those of you who know the Pisgah culture know that, that that's the case. Um, these were people who lived in palisaded villages who built um, elaborate structures in which they, they lived, had elaborate, pretty elaborate gardens, um, did not leave the landscape unchanged, and uh, may or may not have looked like the Native American in this picture. I also think that the book challenges 
convention a little bit in the, the terms of the, the rugged pioneer and the log, pioneer man and woman and log cabin, um, which are in this, this little uh, poster. Um, <laughs> what I found when I looked at, at settlement in the Black Mountains was not sort of rugged individuals and pioneers, but lots of land speculators. Um, in, in, in essence, the um, 18th and early 19th century equivalent of real estate agents who would buy up land and then sort of parcel it out to folks who could afford it. So um, the notion of the pioneer is, is kind of there, but it's, it's a little bit different. And I think that's one of the areas in which the book really um, challenges some stereotypical views. Um, let's go forward again. Of course, the thing for which uh, Mount Mitchell and the Black Mountains are most famous is the story of Elisha Mitchell. And I have to confess that when I first visualized the book, I wasn't going to put this in or just sort of mention it and not really go into a lot of detail about it. Um, if you read the book, you'll see that it now has a whole chapter called Mitchell's Mountain. And the reason for that is that once I got into this, I had wrongly assumed that we pretty much knew the story of Elisha Mitchell and Thomas Klingman and their argument over... Um, over, their, their argument that took place over the Black Mountains. And what I discovered is we know very little about it um, still, despite that it's been investigated by any number of, of historians uh, over time. And this is a sign that the state has at, at Mount Mitchell State Park. If you've been up there, most of you have probably seen it. And actually, the sign has an error on it. Uh, the, the dates are right. As far as I know, Mitchell was born in 1793, and he died in 1857. Um, <coughs> But he did not die in an attempt to approve this mountain, to, to prove this mountain the highest in the eastern United States. By the time Mitchell was there in 1857, it was already pretty well accepted, in fact known, that this was the highest mountain. And some of you may know this, he and Klingman were not arguing over which mountain in the Black Mountain Range was highest. That's kind of a popular misconception that a lot of historians have laid to rest, but it's still out there in the general public. Instead, their dispute was a far more common kind of academic dispute. They were arguing over who had been first to measure it and uh, whether it was Mitchell who had been first to spot it and, and figure out uh, that this was the highest or whether it was his student, Thomas Klingman. And I think there's, it's at least uh, something of an open question, and the book deals with this, and part of my job here is to whet your appetite for what's in the book. But um, that it's at least an open question as to whether Mitchell is actually buried on a mountain that he, in fact, discovered. The, the evidence is really sketchy. He, he made um, uh, four trips into the, into the Black Mountains, and if he, if he was on this particular mountain and decided that it was the highest, it almost had to be on his first trip in 1835, I think. Um, after that, my research and the research of others suggest that he was in other places until he came back in 1857 after the dispute with Klingman. But it's a fascinating story, and their personalities are involved, egos. Um, and I don't think uh, poor Klingman ever quite got his due. He got Klingman's dome named for him in the, in the Smokies. That's right, isn't it, Dan? And, um, and Klingman's Peak in the Black Mountains. But Mitchell's Mountain has this nice observation tower and a nice museum. And uh, his grave, he's buried there. And poor Klingman, his mountain has some radio towers that bounce signals back across uh, western North Carolina. But... It's a very, very interesting story. Um, to my mind, the most interesting person in that story is neither Mitchell nor Klingman, but Big Tom Wilson, who I, I have to say is a, another relative of mine. His, um, I'm thinking his grandmother, I believe I've got this right, on his mother's side was a silver, and we're tangled up with all the, the, the Wilsons and Reeses and others in that area. But um, Big Tom was, uh, was quite a character. He, of course, is the mountain guide who found Mitchell's body after Mitchell had fallen uh, in Sugar Camp Fork, a creek that comes off the end of the Cane River. And um, he found his body. I believe Mitchell had been dead 11 days by the time they, they finally found his body. And the, what makes Big Tom so fascinating is that he sort of traded on that for the rest of his life and became something of an Appalachian icon. He became the, the region's consummate mountain man because he had traded on finding Mitchell's body and became the most sought-after hunting guide the most sought after fishing guide. Everybody wanted to go I'm somewhere with Big Tom and he apparently had the habit of coming over to Asheville so people could see him and, and kind of touch him and, and be around him. And he was photographed uh, as an old man. There's only one picture of him as a young guy that I know of that was in Harper's back in, the, in, in 1857. And uh, he, he became this sort of symbol of 
what the Black Mountains are and are a really interesting character, quite an entrepreneur. In fact, I joke with people, if he were around now, he would be <laughs> probably running a, a string of tanning booths and video rental stores and maybe have taxidermy on the side. So um, a extremely interesting character. And in my mind, one of the more interesting people in the, in the whole Mitchell Klingman saga. Mitchell's death led to a, an upsurge in tourism in the Black Mountains. And this is a hotel that was actually run by some of Big Tom's descendants um, down uh, in the Murchison area, down along the Cane River. And it, it catered to a sportsman. You can tell by the attire here. This is made uh, sometime probably in the 1920s. And it became quite a, quite a stopping off place. And Big Tom's relatives, as well as Big Tom, traded on his, uh, his saga as well. Occasionally, you find uh, in the Black Mountains uh, remnants of this early kind of tourist trade and traffic. And this is a place that's called variously the Sleeping Rock or the Cave or the, the Hanging Rock. It goes by a lot of names, but it's where tourists stayed in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And um, I found this to be an extremely interesting place. It's just off that trail to the summit. Some of you may know where this is if you've been up there. Um, but you can get back in, in under this rock, and um, there's sort of, it's a little bit smoky from where campfires used to be, um, the, the park people tell me, and you can kind of sit back in there too and listen to what tourists are saying as they come down from the summit. And um, so I did that, and I have a scene in the book where I'm kind of sitting in there while it's raining, listening to the, I think I called it patter of tourists as they were coming down the, the mountain and hearing what they were saying. So there are all these little places where the past kind of intersects the present there. Um, two things that really um, changed the Black Mountains occurred in the early 20th century. Uh, the first was logging that took place on a massive scale there. Um, most of it in the years between about 1912 and 1915, but it went on well into the early uh, 1920s before they, they stopped taking uh, timber out of the region. Um, lumbermen, mostly northern lumber companies, most of them from Pennsylvania, um, carpetbaggers of the woods, one historian called them, um, came in to cut timber across the south. And in that way, it's a reflection of a trend that was taking place across the region. But they were especially interested in the Black Mountains because of the supply of um, spruce, a red spruce, which was uh, uh, good for a number of things uh, in construction, including airplane construction in World War I. And uh, the, the loggers pretty much had their way there for you know, about a decade. Railroads uh, came up from the town of, of Black Mountain and up from the other side of the, of the Black Mountains, up the Cane River. Narrow gauge railroads were built to carry out the logs. Um, and of course, the, the results were predictable. That's actually Mount Mitchell with the tower in the background. You can see some of the effects of the logging here. Mostly um, local people worked um, in the logging camps. They used some immigrant labor. But it also provided um, a lot of jobs for local people who worked in the, in the lumber and, and logging industry. And this is a really good picture of the results of this logging by the, um, by the early 1920s. This is kind of looking out down that face into the Cane River Valley again. And there's nothing wrong with that slide. What the dark area you see is the trees that are left after the, the logging. They left this little patch up around uh, Mount Mitchell and across the summit there, that still is, is old growth forest, but you can see the, the logging that took place, quite devastating. And actually I have better slides of this, but the, they're at the press, the pictures are in the book, and so this is just have to kind of make do here. The other thing that took place in the early 20th century that changed the forest ecology anyway, um, was the chestnut blight, which most of you are familiar with, American chestnut trees here, which grew um, in profusion from what I can tell in, in Black Mountain Forest. Um, but the chestnut story is not just a story of a, of a fungus introduced from the Orient, which you probably all know about, or, or if you know anything about the, the history of the region, which killed off American chestnuts, and by the 40s and 50s, it pretty much reduced uh, American chestnut to, from a majestic tree to the status of a kind of understory shrub. They still sprout from the stumps and still grow up, but they pretty quickly contract the blight and, and die. But uh, most of the time, that's the only part of the story that's told, is that chestnut trees died and are no longer with us in the mountains. What I want to do here is talk for a second about 
the different ways in which um, state officials and federal officials in the Forest Service reacted to these two things. They acted, reacted very differently to the logging than they did to the chestnut blight. The, one of the chief reactions to the logging was to create Mount Mitchell State Park. The, the state was in a lot of ways um, kind of shamed into creating a park there. There was some bad publicity about destroying Mount Mitchell, destroying this um, place where Professor Mitchell had lost his life. Um, there was also a, a good bit of striking at Southern pride, um, saying that you, know, you let these northerners come in and cut all your timber. And it, it got North Carolina legislators off the dime, and they reacted and, and created uh, Mount Mitchell State Park and began a massive program, the, the Forest Service uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the state park officials as well in the early 20th century of reforestation, which went on well into the 1930s there. And they experimented with a lot of different trees. You can still um, go up uh, on certain peaks in the Black Mountains and find Norway spruce growing. Um, there was Douglas fir there until pretty recently. I'm not sure if there's still any left or not. They experimented with a lot of trees in reforestation. Finally ended up using mostly native um, trees, uh, red spruce and Fraser fir. As a number of people I have noted, and this is pretty well known among historians who worked on the area. Um, it was a monumental task. After the area was logged, there were extensive fires that burned over the region, ignited by the slash or the trash left behind from logging. And um, of course the railroads, the trains spewed sparks from their sawdust-fired engines and, and uh, wood-fired engines. And so it was, there were a number of serious fires in the region. So when they got ready to reforest, I like this slide because it shows what a kind of a monumental task it was to try to put these things back. You see some, um, it's hard to tell if those are spruces or firs there, but kind of going out and setting seedlings among this kind of stuff to try to get the forest to come back. But the effort here was one of restoration to put the forest back. Um, the chestnut blight, the reaction was very different, in my mind anyway, it was very different. In, in this case, instead of sort of trying to recreate what had been lost, the effort was to get as much chestnut as possible, as quickly as possible, before it was lost. The blight was coming, it was moving up the slopes in a kind of a shotgun sort of pattern, spreading, and so the idea was to cut American chestnut and make use of that wood for um, uh, construction, telephone poles, railroad ties, these type of things, um, before it was lost. And so there was a massive effort to cut chestnut before it died. Here's some good pictures of this. From what I can tell, um, a lot of the chestnut cut in the Black Mountains went to Champion Paper, uh, and what then called Champion Fiber, um, over in uh, Canton, which was one place that uh, not only had a, a patent on a process actually for producing paper and, and pulp from chestnut, which was an uncommon process, but they also used it to extract tannin. This is champion. They also used it to extract tannin from the bark, which is a product used in leather work. And the amount of chestnut cut there is, and shipped to champion is just amazing. There's a picture in the book that's really better than this. Of just uh, as far as you can see, chestnut stacked up that had been salvaged from the nearby mountains. And um, you get a little bit of sense of what was going on. Here's one of the vats from which they extracted the tannin and then shipped it out of there in these tankers to, uh, throughout the South. Um, so it's really a, a kind of a, a two-phase story about forest conservation. In terms of the, the logging and the spruce fir forest, they really tried to bring that back. In terms of the chestnut, I think the reaction was very different. It was to salvage as much as possible. And uh, not to get too far ahead of myself here, but there's some speculation on the part of ecologists that had that not happened, had the foresters and the conservationists not been so quick to cut American chestnut, especially in the Black Mountains where it grew at pretty high elevations, that uh, that process removed some of the hardier specimens from the gene pool. And we now know that American chestnut's developing resistance to the blight. It's a very slow process. It's much slower here than in Europe, for example, um, primarily because the blight ran so wild in these eastern forests for so long. Um, but had they not taken those hardiest specimens from the gene pool and, and cut those out, perhaps nature might have figured out a way to cope with this thing had they been left. And so, you know, hindsight's always 2020, and it's it's unfair for us to kind of go back and say, well, gee, you know, didn't they make a terrible mistake? 
But it would be interesting to think about what might have happened uh, had, that, had that been done just a little bit differently and had they not been so quick to go ahead and try to salvage all this for use in construction and tanning. So now um, chestnuts are pretty much gone, uh, reduced to the status of a kind of shrub in most of the forest. And I found a lot of these walking around in the, in the Black Mountains. They still sprout from stumps. Um, I actually went to a place there called Chestnut Knob. There must be, and we were talking about a thousand of those in the Appalachians, a place that's called Chestnut Knob. Um, but, and I was curious to see if that had something to do with the name. And sure enough, I found, um, you know, chestnuts growing yay high there. Um, but it's pretty much been reduced to, to that sort of a, a tree. Uh, the other kind of neat story in the book, I think, toward the, in, in terms of the 1920s and 30s, is the story of wildlife conservation. Um, there was a massive effort after the logging to uh, restore fish and wildlife in the region that had been displaced by that. And this, these are the remains of an old fish hatchery that's there along Neal's Creek, um, which is a tributary to the South Toe River. You can still see it was WPA money that built it during the New Deal. You can still see it. And it was part of my kind of walking the land uh, experience to get out and look at this old fish hatchery. The other thing that was done was to uh, cater not just to sportsmen who wanted to come there and fish and hunt, but also to tourists. The 1950s, the post-war era, was a, a time of a tourist boom in the United States. And um, people were mobile with, with cars and, and were out. It was the thing to do to take the family out to some nature site, some uh, national park or uh, important uh, uh, site like Mount Mitchell or the Black Mountains. And so the other thing that happened is that there began to be this kind of catering to tourists. Now, sports catering to sportsmen and tourists are, is fine, and I don't take issue with that. But as anyone who's worked on Appalachian history knows, when that happens, uh, lots of local people get squeezed. And uh, local people found it very difficult in the Black Mountains to carry on the kinds of things they had been doing in the past, which was to hunt and fish without licenses at any time they felt like it. And um, once the state and the federal officials began to enforce hunting seasons and bag limits and that kind of thing and began to cater to tourists in campgrounds like these, um, local people very much felt squeezed out of, out of what was theirs. Um, some of the more interesting interviews I conducted uh, in doing the book were with game wardens who told me all kinds of uh, fascinating stories about um, sort of chasing down poachers and who they regarded as poachers. But really, a lot of them were local people um, who were just trying to carry on. One, the game warden said, yeah, there was this one fellow from Burnsville, and I think I fought him about every Saturday night. Uh, he was up jackalighting deer along the parkway. So there, there are two sides to this story, and what I think this does is it raises a lot of questions about class in environmental history, and back to that question of whose nature and how do you define it, and this is fine for middle-class urban people, to come to the Black Mountains to enjoy camping and fishing. And for sportsmen, it was great for the state. The state made a lot of money from the sale of um, uh, hunting licenses and so forth. But in the end, you know, local people are squeezed somewhat. And that's, uh, that's a tough part of the story to, to take in. Um, more evidence of, of tourism. And the reason I put this slide up there is this is an old structure on the very summit of Mount Mitchell. You probably recognize this as the old concession stand. Um, very different from some of the other structures there in that this one was originally built in the 30s and it has a kind of log cabin sort of look to it. Um, if you look at, say, the, the restaurant on Mount Mitchell, if you've, and I don't have a good slide of that, it's different because it was built in the 50s and it reflects that new emphasis on auto tourism and the, the tourist trade. It's a glass structure, a lot of views, a lot of stonework, um, much more modern. And um, so the, you can kind of see the tourist trade there evolve from this to the, the more modern kind of auto tourist, and that's also a theme of the book. And finally, the, the last part of the book deals with um, the current controversy on Mount Mitchell. It's been going on really since uh, about 1955 over what's killing the trees. And I'm sure that this audience knows a, a good deal about this. And um, I'll kind of try to sketch it in, and then I want to talk about, as a writer, and especially as a historian, kind of how, how you deal with something like this. Um, this is a dead tree uh, there on Mount Mitchell, a Fraser fir. And you probably know that in the 50s, they discovered the, in 1955, they discovered the presence of a, uh, 
of a, a pest, an insect pest called the, they called it at the time the balsam woolly aphid. It's now called the balsam woolly adelgid. Very interesting kind of organism, and adelgid is a, a primitive life form. All of them are, in effect, females who lay, lay and fertilize their own eggs. And talk about strange territory for a historian, um, the, uh, the breeding habits of balsam woolly adelgids is kind of strange territory. But for a long time, they thought that it was the adelgid that was killing Fraser furs. And uh, for about 30 years, they tried to find a way to remedy that. And there were some unsavory kinds of things that went on uh, on Mount Mitchell and in the state park. For one thing, they sprayed the area with lindane um, pretty regularly. And uh, my, my records are sketchy on this. I want to be careful how I phrase it. But the spraying began in the 60s and went on into the early 1970s. And at the time, again, we want to be careful of judging people by present standards. Um, at the time, the information about pesticides like lindane, which is similar to DDT, not as, doesn't remain in the environment as long as DDT, was still kind of up in the air, but still Rachel Carson's book was out there in 1962 and this, this spraying went on. And there were a lot of kind of crude experiments conducted there to try to figure out whether this lindane was damaging or not. They would uh, catch rodents and trap them and spray them and try to decide what constituted a lethal dose of lindane. Um, they also uh, sprayed bird areas and then kind of waited to see if birds would resume what they called a general bird activity after the, the spraying. Uh, and they sprayed some areas frequented by tourists. They were very much concerned about the seen areas of the park. And I don't know how much you know about this, but lindane will kill balsam woolly adelgids. It clobbers them. It's as effective as, as DDT on lice and, and adelgids. It kills them. But the problem is you can't spray it aerially. You can't use it from airplanes. You have to literally coat Fraser Fur's root and branch with the stuff. That's why it's still effective for Christmas trees and probably saved the North Carolina Christmas tree industry. Um, but spraying went on until the 1970s when there were some more serious studies uh, about lindane. And then in the 80s, in the early 1980s, 1982 to be exact, the debate shifted, and you all are, I'm sure, familiar with this, uh, the work of uh, Dr. Robert Brock from NC State, who began to, to do research uh, in the Black Mountains based on some work he had done in European forests, and began to advance a theory very cautiously at first that perhaps the damage to trees there is not just from the um, balsam woolly adelgid, but also from airborne pollutants, and maybe even from acid deposition. And one of the things that kind of cued Brock into this was uh, the notion he discovered that the growth of red spruce had slowed down markedly, which wasn't affected by the adelgid, and began to postulate that maybe um, what was really happening here was something much more serious and that trees were being killed by air pollution. Now, there's no question that, that trees on Mount Mitchell are dying. They're also regenerating. You can see that in this slide here. Fraser firs are coming back, and it's not real clear, but you can see the dead trees and the younger ones underneath it. Uh, here's another slide that would show that if it were just a little bit clearer, um, the dead trees with new growth. There's a scientific argument here among scientists, and um, I got right into the middle of it. Uh, it was a lot more complex than I thought. Um, there, there's good evidence that air pollution is part of the problem, and, and Brock was a real pioneer in pointing that out. There were other scientists, equally important, who did equally careful calculated work, who decided that, that might not be the only factor if it were a factor at all. And I just, again, I want to be careful because the research is complicated. It turns out that red spruce has a natural tendency to slow down um, sometimes about uh, 30 to 40 years after it's been logged. So part of the slow growth in red spruce, some people argued, might have been just simply a natural reaction to the logging that took place in the, in the Black Mountains in the 1920s. So what happened, in essence, uh, from what I can tell, and I'm a historian looking at this from the outside, I, I claim no scientific expertise other than just reading what scientists write. What happened is it, it kind of set off two camps in the scientific community of people who believed that air pollution was an underlying factor led by, by Bob Brock. And I don't know if any of you have met Bob or not. He's probably spoken here. He's, um, he, he has an evangelist enthusiasm about this, and he pulls no punches when it comes to talking about air pollution and its effects, and he never did. 
Um, but still, other scientists were arguing that the situation was too complex just to pinpoint that particular argument. So it kind of split scientists into two camps, the, the Bruck camp and a camp of others who said that if this is happening, it's more complex. It became a political argument. Environmentalists, and I consider myself one, tended to line up behind Bruck and the air pollution school. Other people who were interested in the Black Mountains for other reasons and other agencies, including TVA, which took some of the flack for this, and uh, General Motors, who uh, sponsored a study in the Black Mountains, kind of lined up on the other side of the equation, that there are other factors. Um, the natural death of, of old growth forests, uh, the severe weather, the adelgid, so on and so forth. And uh, as I said, as a, as a writer from outside, I kind of waded into the middle of this. And uh, if, if you read that last chapter, you know anything about writing, you'll see some fancy footwork that I was sort of doing, skirting around it, because there are a number of um, ecologists, biologists at Appalachian State, where I teach, who kind of have problems with this model of air pollution as a you know, determining factor, and they argue that we need more science. But where I came down finally is this, and uh, this is sort of the bottom line. Uh, it, while the scientists continue to argue and the political camps continue to form, and they probably were not done with this yet, um, the trees continue to die. It's just sort of the bottom line in the whole thing. While, while scientists argue and politicians and environmentalists and others feud, the trees continue to die. And what the scientific debate did, I think, as a historian, I'm speaking strictly as a historian here, is it allowed the government a chance to kind of do nothing about this, to decide who to believe and wait for more science. And that's my real problem with it. It's not whether I believe one or the other. What I would suggest is that nature is so complex that you're never going to be able to read out all these other factors and you know, read land use out of the equation or read out the natural tendency of, of old growth forests to die and replenish themselves, or read the adelgid out of the equation. It's there, it's not going anywhere. You're not gonna be able to read it out. But what this debate did was give the government time to sort of stall. And so we still haven't gotten anywhere until just recently with the, the Clean Smokestacks Act in doing something about air pollution. And what I argue in the book is that whether this is the cause or not, and my conclusion is that, that a clear link, a kind of cause and effect link is gonna be impossible in this to, to prove. And this is, this is not really a new idea. Others have said it. Because you can't, you can't read these things out of the equation. It's, it's never going to be that way. But whether or not we can prove that, there are all kinds of reasons to do things about air pollution in the mountains that have nothing to do with these dead trees on Mount Mitchell. They have to do with uh, rising asthma rates in uh, Western North Carolina's children. And my daughter has asthma, so it's a very, very personal um, issue for me. It has everything to do with the tourist trade. Focus groups cite air pollution as a reason for not visiting um, the Black Mountains and the Great Smoky Mountains, as, as people know. So I think what, uh, what this has come down to is there's a kind of a, an eclectic interpretation that passes for truth in the scientific community. And that is uh, that there's a kind of death spiral going on here. A lot of trees are dying and, and continue to die for a lot of reasons. There's also replenishment of the trees. And we have to really wait. Fraser fir is fairly uh, slow growing species. So we have to wait to see what's going to happen. Um, whether it's going to replenish and have some resistance to the adelgid or, or whether some evidence that that's developing as well. But there's plenty of reason to do something about this. It really doesn't have anything to do much with these dead trees um, on Mount Mitchell. Um, I did find a kind of interesting thing in that the scientists who worked for um, General Motors and who were from TVA sometimes reached startlingly different conclusions from those working for the EPA. Um, and scientists don't like to hear that, and I'm kind of reluctant to say it in a public forum, but Scientists are like historians. If they go looking for something, they find it. And uh, that's how you get funded, and that's what makes science go. And I'll be willing to take whatever flack's coming from that statement. Um, as I said, there are plenty of reasons to do something about this that don't have anything to do with these, these dead trees. Now, finally, and I want to leave you with this thought, there's a, a question here about, so what, what about this? You've looked at, at 10,000 years of, of Black Mountain history. What, what would you say? Is it a story of decline? It's very easy to write that story. It's extremely easy to talk about all the things that have gone wrong there and the, how you know, once magnificent mountains were depleted by human greed, et cetera, et cetera. It's easy and that's, that's part of the story. 
This is a slide from the 1920s. It's another one of those some logging slides that shows um, where the, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just bare on those sides, and you're looking out there. But if you look at that, and you look at that bare mountain, and you follow it up with this, which is a slide that I took, it's almost the same angle. Let's go back here. I don't know. I mean, it looks to me like you could, you could sort of argue a progressive narrative in a way that people, uh, we still have problems and things that have not been solved. But certainly, um, in terms of, of environment, we can look at those hillsides peeled off, peeled off there, and we can go back to that. And you know, there may be another story to be told here. Um, so I think it comes down to this question, and this is what I grapple with in the conclusion of the book, and I really don't want to give that away, so I'll, I'll save it. But I think it comes down to when you look at this wonderful place with all this 10,000 years of history behind it, the question is, do you see a rainbow or a gathering storm? So thank you. I'll, I'll leave it there, and I'll be happy to, to field questions if you have them. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I was very fortunate. Um, I had, uh, my major funding came from um, National Endowment for the Humanities. I had a, a, a year-long fellowship for college teachers. It's a wonderful thing. The National Endowment for the Humanities deserves all our support. And um, I had time off to work on it because of that. Um, my grant didn't approach what some of the scientists got for um, acid deposition research. So in fact, it didn't approach 1% of what some of them got for acid deposition research. And, and also, my department was very um, nice. I had uh, one whole year off from the department to work on this when I wasn't teaching. So, But you're right to point that out, that my perspective is, is as kind of colored by this as a scientist's perspective would be because I come from the humanities in a very different kind of vein. Um, so that's the answer to that. And I sent them a book so they have it. <laughs> Prove I use their money. That, that's a really good question. The question is what's the advantage of coming from the, the humanities rather than the sciences? Um, I think that uh, that one of the advantages is the ability to see in science the very kind of thing I'm talking about here, which is uh, the, the political nature of science, which I don't think some scientists see. If there's scientists in the audience, I'm happy to hear from you. But um, I, I think that, that scientists in the pure realm of research don't necessarily step back sometimes and look at the big picture and sort of the, the human and cultural implications of these things. And that's one advantage I think the humanities afford. It affords a number of disadvantages as well, which is trying to understand all that science for one thing. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the scientists are apt to sniff whenever we get near their stuff, you know, because uh, you know, they're, they're silver over there in history and um, he doesn't teach biology, he doesn't teach ecology, you know, what's, he, what's he doing writing about our stuff? And, and they're right, it's easy to misinterpret data and that's why uh, I, I try to be extremely, extremely careful and am not always successful. Um, but it, it's, there, there are disadvantages. But I think the advantage is the big picture. And also, to provide some perspective, one of the things I say in the book that is serious as the decline of, of um, high elevation forests is, that's just one very small piece of, of Mount Mitchell and the Black Mountains history. And we really need to see that for what it is when we start summing up the human experience there. And, um, you know, that, that's kind of my, my take on that. So advantages and disadvantages. There's some tap dancing for you. Yeah. <laughs> Possible follow-up with the uh, integration of science and the humanities or history. Um, do you see any connections between using your knowledge of the history of its area to further either a romantic view about the possible environmental problems that we're having or just the, the scientific version of, of that? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, I, what, what bothers me about the way most people look at this issue, and in fact the way the, the state park and the state of North Carolina 
interpret the region's history is that th there seems to be this kind of split between nature here and humans here, and that nature is this very passive thing that human beings act on and change. And what I would like to see if I were king for a day and able to make this happen would be to have Mount Mitchell's past and, and the Black Mountains past interpreted for people with nature as a very active agent in the equation. That, that nature is in some ways writing its own story there, quite apart from what humans do. And my, my answer to that would be to have humans always, always take nature into account and realize that nature is often quite unpredictable, despite what we think we know and that any human action be carried out with the utmost care. I, I would not read humans out of the equation. I think this is a place that's made much more interesting by the people that have been there. Mitchell, Clemen, Big Tom Wilson, and we could go on. Uh, the C.N. Meese, the first game warden, uh, John Simcox Holmes is the state's first forester. There are a lot of interesting people there, and I wouldn't read them out of that, out of that equation, but I would like to see the history interpreted that way and, and really acted on that way. I'm, I'm in favor um, of some sort of reforestation problem, uh, uh, program there if we can get some of these problems solved. And I would be in favor of reintroducing predators to the region, which have been pretty much taken out. Um, and I'd be in favor of allowing tourists to go there. Fewer cars, but I would be in favor of, of all that. So. Yeah. Do you know if anybody either at App State or other places that is continuing down working right now, uh, but uh, um, Yeah, the question is uh, whether uh, the kind of research that um, Robert Bruck at NC State did is ongoing. Um, I know that, that he has kind of gotten off on another sort of bent here. He first began work on the rainforests, and then he uh, has now come around to studying long-term climate change in the Appalachians, which may be the, may throw a completely different wrinkle into this. That research was really too new when I was doing mine to to draw many conclusions from it. But there are scientists there um, at, at Appalachian. Um, Howard Neufeld is one who's working in the Smokies on the pollution problems. Um, there's an anthropologist there who's very active in uh, Harvard Air. Some of you have seen his, his book, Appalachian Tragedy, who's been very active in sort of trying to chart the effects of, of um, air pollution on forests. And um, also uh, uh, Matt Rowe, who's an ecologist there, has done work on, on wildlife. So some of that work is ongoing, and I, I think it remains to be seen whether if we start really looking at long-term climate change, if that's going to change this, it, it might completely alter what I've just said. You know, this, is, this is current as of sort of the mid to late 90s, which is kind of the time frame a historian works with on a book. Scientists work in much tighter things. What came out last week may change you know, what, what they're doing. Exactly, exactly. And that, and that, but my understanding of that is it's pretty new, I mean, in terms of really gauging the long-term stuff. And that may be, as I say, it may change this completely. Oh. I saw a question somewhere. Yeah. Um, you know, when I go hiking out there, I go on this thing called the Toll Road. Do you, do you know when the Toll Road was in its heyday and where, where it used to go? From? Yeah, you're talking about the, the road around by, runs around by Camp Alice and uh, around. Uh, it comes out of Montreal. Yeah, right. That was, that was in, your, the, the railroad began there when the logging began, in the, and it's basically the same road from what I can tell. And it became a motor road, it was really in its heyday during the 1920s when automobiles went into pretty widespread use. You could drive over from Asheville and drive the toll road up one way and um, turn around and come back down. It was gated, and um, there's a one of the things that's, that's also in the book that, that I um, uh, talk about a lot is, is kind of the, the coming of the automobile and how that really revolutionized the tourist trade there, like it did everywhere. And the, the motor road is a real um, interesting sort of place to see that. And um, I've never really hiked it up all the way from, from uh, Montreal to wherever it, it starts there, but I've been on other parts of it around. Um, but I think, uh, you know, 1920s, it would be roughly when it was in its heyday. Yeah. I'm asking you to kind of project yourself into the future, which might be difficult for a historian, but <laughs> you said it was interesting, it would be very interesting if we had taken a different track with the chestnut to see if disease resistance, you know, emerged. Yeah. 
If you were a historian 100 years from now, looking back on this period of history, what do you think are some of the decisions that we're making right now that an historian would look back on and say, wow, it would have been very interesting had they taken a different track? Well, I, I first hope historians and the rest of us are around in 100 years, given the, given the state of the environment. <laughs> Um, uh, some of the experts tell us we only have about 50, and that, yeah, that would be my daughter's generation, so I hope I'm around. Um, I, I think that, that maybe this generation, my generation actually, and, and the, the students here, your generation, um, may actually be called to account for not having paid more attention to some of these things. And I think people may well look back and say, look, they were squabbling over the causes of forest decline, and scientists were arguing, and governments were procrastinating. And meanwhile, this went on. And it's kind of, are you familiar with the, the story of Easter Island at all? And the, the natives there cut down all the trees and eventually did themselves in environmentally. And I've often kind of wondered, uh, I heard Jared Diamond give a talk and he said, you know, what, his students were always asking him, uh, what was the guy thinking who cut down the last tree on Easter Island? You know, what was, he, what was going through his head? And I think people might look back at us like that. Like, what were these people thinking when this evidence was in front of them? And uh, to use one of, Bob Bruck's favorite expressions, when clearly the canaries were dying, the, the high altitude forests were, were dying, high elevation forests were dying, and we did nothing. You know, we, we stood and watched it and quibbled over this. So I would, uh, I, I would think that we might be held accountable. And I was ecstatic with the passage of the Clean Smokestacks Act. I thought that was just wonderful. In fact, I had to rewrite the last part of the book when that passed. And then, you know, we've had the subsequent dismantling of some of the clean air legislation at the federal level, and uh, which may render that whole thing uh, moot. And it, it's, you know, so I'm much bothered by that, and I think people may look back and, and rightly hold us accountable for this. And may say that, you know, people like Silver were trying to be objective historians and didn't get in there and swing the activist bat. <laughs> Things I've heard about um, both causing deterioration of the view of the Smokies and actually generally the Black Mountains. Uh, coal fired smokestacks are the main perpetrator of the all of hundreds of millions of them. Is, to pick up on this lady's question here a minute ago, is there a viable alternative in the United States of America for all of the tourism? Because that's so deeply ingrained. Really good question. Is there a viable alternative to auto tourism? And you're, you're exactly right. Um, some of the more current research on this actually suggests that, that this pollution is, is local, locally generated a lot of it, even on, on Mount Mitchell, that it may be coming from places like I-40. Um, even Burnsville, you know, figures into this with, its, with the cars. Um, I, I would hope so. It, it's, it's a touchy question because it, you, you really get into a, American culture there when you start talking about the automobile. And there, there's so much stuff, if you know the, you, you might know the work of historian uh, John Stilgo, who's worked on uh, the automobiles and how it just transformed um, the United States and, and how roads kind of create their own ecology. And, and it would be a, I say all this to suggest that it would be a huge step to do away from that, to step back from it, you know, to go back to horses, which from what I read weren't all that pollution free either. Um, and, and so I don't know, but I, I think some of the answers may, may lie with things like hybrid technology in, in cars and, um, and, and making cars more uh, fuel efficient, less polluting. I think, and I think we need the federal government on that. That's a, a personal opinion because I don't think that people are apt to do that on their own. I mean, I reference Easter Island again. Like people cut down those trees. Um, and I don't think we'll change until it's kind of forced upon us. So if there is a way, I would argue that it's through federal legislation to cut pollution and also government incentives to create cars that are, or, or some sort of vehicle that's less polluting. Um, my students always want to say, well, wouldn't things be fine if we all just uh, rode a bicycle and lived like the Amish? And uh, I, 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 yes, <laughs> things, things might be better, although the, the Amish have their pollution problems too. Um, but I don't think that's a likely scenario given American culture. And I, I really think that our hope probably lies with some sort of technology and, and, um, and, and finding some way to produce transportation that's cleaner. 
I, you know, I'd like to see public transportation. I mean, Boone, where I live, is just it, is awful. I mean, people fall out of those hollers in the morning, you know, coming into to Boone, and it's got a traffic jam like Research Triangle Park or something. Um, so I, I, I don't have a good, quick kind of answer, but that's what I'd like to see. Um, yeah. Can you comment on the, um, the loss of the chestnut trees and the mast and how it fed the wildlife area and the uh, ongoing efforts to reintroduce the blight resistant version of the tree? Um, yeah, I'll try to, to comment on chestnut and how it affected wildlife and to reintroduce the, the blight resistant trees. Um, I'm better on the first part of that question so I looked into it in the, in the Black Mountains. Um, I think it's difficult to gauge how the loss of the chestnut affected wildlife, particularly in that region, because most of the wildlife had been depleted so badly by logging and by overhunting by the time the chestnut blight really took hold that you know, it's, it's a tough thing to call. Um, what I do note, though, is that it took wildlife a while to adapt, but they did adapt. Apparently, red oaks and, and northern red oaks and other things moved into the chestnut's niche and not quite as reliable with mast. As you probably know, chestnut mast is among the, the most reliable sources of food. But wildlife managed to adapt to that. And, um, I, but I think it's a tough call as to the effect. If you had had a stable wildlife population to begin with, we might be able to judge that. And I think that's another place where kind of unpredictable nature and these other things enter into the story. We can't read out any one of those things. In terms of the, of the blight-resistant hybrids or um, the hypovirulence, I believe is the, the term they use for the, the strains that are uh, somewhat immune. From what I read on that, and I, I'm no expert just where it touches my research, but from what I read, um, a cure for American trees, if there is to be one, is still a long way off in terms of bringing back pure American chestnuts that we knew once before, uh, we knew before. Um, and most of the hope does lie with some sort of hybrid with uh, an oriental chestnut. At least that's my read of the research. Um, I found some, what I regarded as uh, astonishingly big American chestnuts walking around in the, in the Black Mountains. In fact, I brought a burr here with me somewhere, I don't know what happened to it, um, that I picked up over there and reported those to people. And they weren't that surprised to see those those trees. Apparently they're more common than I thought. Um, but I think m probably most of the hope lies with some sort of hybrid and us you know, making our peace with that. And that's another really good place to kind of argue the story. Is it a story of decline or can we somehow turn it into a, a progressive narrative? Are we going to just lament the chestnut's demise or are we going to you know, try to find a solution and live with whatever that is as some kind of maybe nature a little bit less perfect than we would like, but livable uh, nonetheless, you know, and then keep our eye out for the next parasite that's going to invade. Um, uh, to me, that's one of those, one of those stories. And I, I can only speak to your question as it applies to the, to the Black Mountains, but I didn't detect a lot, of, a lot of decline in wildlife because wildlife is already in bad shape by the time the chestnut blight really hit. I'm deer and you know, bears, things that would feed on, on the mass. Research into the North Carolina Geologic Survey and the early fire service? Um, I, I did more so with the uh, uh, geological survey because, that, first of all, with Mitchell, who was part of that and, and who conducted some of the first geological surveys done uh, in the state. And um, also because for a while they uh, encompassed the Division of Forestry, which um, the North Carolina's first state forester who figured really big in Black Mountain history is a man named John Simcox Holmes. Uh, Yale graduate, Yale Forestry School conservationist. So I, I looked into that to the extent of you know, what they were doing there in terms of conservation practices. And they were pretty much right out of that progressive conservation uh, efficiency sort of uh, mold you know, in terms of reforestation, putting things back. Let's find a fast growing tree to, to put in here. And um, also, though Mount Mitchell was for a while, and this is something you, you'll probably find interesting, envisioned as a kind of demonstration forest. It wasn't really initially supposed to be a tourist kind of place, but a demonstration forest where they were gonna show North Carolinians and tourists that they could get them up there, um, the benefits of sustainable forestry and progressive forestry. So I did get into that and, and found it interesting. I found that Holmes' story was one that really, I couldn't find much on and kind of had to tell that story myself. And he's an extremely interesting figure. All the foresters in this state know him. 
and there's a picture of him down in the, I forgot what they call it, Division of Forest Resources now. I get the state, the state names change every odd Tuesday, but um, there, I did look into that and, and discovered quite an interesting tale there. How do uh, current attitudes towards the preservation and conservation of, of the local environment compare with those that you've seen historically, and what kind of hope does it give you for the future? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, uh, in, in some ways, I'm encouraged, because I think um, more people, and you know, this audience is evidence of that, more people are concerned about some of these issues now, particularly younger people than um, say they were in the, in the 1980s um, when I first started teaching at, at ASU. Um, I find much more environmental awareness among my students now, what I loosely call environmental awareness, than I did then. Um, my, my reason to be discouraged about it is that I think um, in the case of the Black Mountains and, and Mount Mitchell, I think local people are a lot less interested now. Um, they, they have kind of written it off. It's, that's my read anyway. And, and so the concern for these areas really comes from people from outside that area. And that, that may be understandable considering that park policies and forest service policies and other policies have basically written local people out of that equation. Um, and so I, I guess I'm, I'm waffling again about your, your answer, but I'm encouraged to, to see environmental awareness. I'm discouraged by things like the current administration's uh, stance on, on clean air, which is no stance. Um, and, I, I, um, and I'm also discouraged by the lack of interest from local people. It, I found it difficult to get local people when I interviewed them, except for the game wardens, to, to really talk about Mount Mitchell and how they felt about it. And one of the things I did was collect stories from people just Kind of, I've got a, a backlog of these things um, about what people remembered. And, and the recurring theme among people who live there, I'm talking about people who still live in the Cane River Valley or the Tow River Valley or uh, along the South Tow or Burnsville or Yancey County, um, the recurring theme was, well, you know, a long time ago, it used to be a great place and we, we cared about it and we hunted there and we fished there and we did all these things. But now, you know, it's, it's all shot and the, sort of the outsiders have ruined it. And, and it's really for them now. And so I find that very discouraging as it relates to my research in that area. And I don't know if anyone's a true native of Boone anymore. It's hard to, it's hard to figure that out. Um, but the, the same thing prevails there. Local people and outsiders are kind of at odds over these issues. And I don't think we'll do much until there's common cause between those groups. Uh, well, I, I, think, um, I think game wardens like to have their story told, uh, for, for one thing. And they were, they were quite literally on the front lines of, of wildlife conservation in this region. Um, there's one fellow over there, I'm not going to um, use his name here, who apparently had been a, a warden in the, in the Smokies and had begun enforcing park wildlife policies. And he, he shot a guy and killed him in the Smokies. And Curtis Creek, which is an, an area kind of adjacent to the Black Mountains. Some of you may know the Curtis Creek area. It was part of a game refuge there in the Blacks. Um, they had a lot of trouble with locals, so they hired this guy and, and brought him in. And, and first thing he did was shoot somebody there. Um, didn't kill him, but he, he shot him, and it really brought local people in line. And so the game wardens, the game wardens love to tell the story about how they came in and, and straightened things out and really sort of put things right. And I had to be wary of that. You're always careful with oral history, but I had to kind of be wary of, of some of their tales. Not that they were exaggerated, but they just were more willing to talk than some other people. The other really good interview I had was with, um, well, besides Bob Bruck, he's always great, but um, was with uh, Big Tom Wilson's great-granddaughter, a woman named Virginia Boone, who I tracked down uh, living along the Cane River. Great house and, and really indicative of modern Appalachian culture, all these great kind of pioneer relics in the house and a big satellite dish in the back. I, and I, I, I loved it. It was perfect. Um, but, but she was very willing, willing to talk once I kind of got her to, to open up. But she was also of the mind that, well, you know, this used to be a nice place. And my family's here and we've held on to this little patch of land, but, you know, it's all kind of sliding downhill. 
And I, I think the game wardens, the reason they were willing to talk is they see themselves as heroes in the story, um, if people who were there doing what was right. And local people see this as, a lot of them as something that was taken from them and then run by the state or the Forest Service or from, from outside agencies. Uh, yeah, I don't, and I want to be careful here. I don't want to overstate my case. It's just this is just a trend that, that I've noted. There are plenty of local people who would be willing to to get involved with something and who care care deeply about um, where they live. I think it's just that they tend to see things as having slid downhill more. Um, I, I would think that that one of the things we could do we would sort of um, and this this hits me where I live is to to kind of get off our uh, academic high horse and get out and, and talk with some of these people. And, and listen to what they have to say. And uh, I found that the more I did that, the more I got out of the archives and, and talked with people, um, the more, for, for want of a better term, bridges I was able to build with them and realize that we shared some of the same concerns. That, that some of the people that I tried to interview in, in the course of writing the book really regarded me as an outsider too, despite my name. And I, I think another thing that could be done, and I, I not sure how to go about this, but um, th there needs to something needs to happen so that money doesn't walk and talk <laughs> in, in the Southern Appalachians like it does every place else um, in in the United States. Um, one of the one of the biggest problems that will threaten the blacks in, in coming years of the Black Mountains is uh, uh, summer home development, golf course development. You've seen that around here. I'm not telling you anything new. So far, the, the area there has been protected because of the national forest um, area that's quite large. But I think even that's at risk at some point because people just have money and you know, they're going to spend it to develop that region. And there's a lot of money to be made. And where this touches local people is that Appalachian people have finally figured out what they have that's valuable in its land. And they're getting incredibly high prices for that land. And it becomes a dicey issue for someone like me to say, hey, you know, why do you want to sell, sell off this land to a developer who's in turn into a golf course when they say, well, you know, look, I make all this money doing it. And so I, I, I'm not sure I've got a real good answer to your question, but I think we could talk more and become more sensitive to where they are and why they do certain things. Like I, I hear people in my department at my university a lot of times um, talk about um, local people dropping you know, refrigerators off the side of the road or throwing transmissions in the river. <laughs> you know, these, these kinds of things that go on all the time. And there seems to be a class barrier there that we're not doing enough to, to break down. And I encountered that, and I, I found that sometimes you can break it down. I found that the best way to, to break down the barriers with people I was interviewing was to, to talk to them like I knew what I was talking about, to know the case, a, a lawyer would say, to, um, to know about their history and their family history and then go in and, and talk with them. And I wish we talked more across classes and across um, these kinds of lines. And other than that, I don't know. Um, it's, uh, I, I try not to be a prophet of doom, but I, I, you know, I don't know. Is anybody else on? Yep, yeah, one more. Pretty uh, concentrated movement back in the 60s, I believe, all the 70s, to, to acquire this land by the federal government. No, I haven't heard any possibility of revival, and I, I deal with that in the book. It was in the 1970s, you're quite right. Um, There's an effort to create a national park in the region, and from what I can tell, it's, uh, the, the Charlotte Observer said that the national park proposal um, landed in the public arena like a two-ton boulder dropped in a mountain pond. Um, it created a lot of controversy. The Forest Service had its own ambitions for the area to keep using it from a conservation standpoint. The park advocates had, uh, the national park advocates had a sort of a preservationist agenda to keep it for tourism and, and, uh, 
and, and for use by elites in a way. Um, local people, again, felt squeezed. One of the things they were going to lose was the right to hunt in the region, which is, has a long tradition, and also the right to gather um, herbs and roots, which is a big business there if you, if you get in there and talk to them. Um, Jesse Helms weighed in on it as being against the proposal because, according to him, it mountain people being allowed to gather ginseng kept them off welfare, and he was all for that. Um, so there, there are a lot of forces that kind of lined up against it. The state of North Carolina, from what I can tell, again, were not, the state park was not anxious to let go of an area that it had nurtured and sort of brought up the Cane River Club, which as long as we're on that topic, I could never get those people to talk to me or let me on that property. Um, so I, the, that's a gap in the book. Um, I, I think there were problems there. And a, a study went forward, and it was championed by Congressman uh, Roy Taylor from uh, Black Mountain, who on, sat on the Parks Committee at that time. But I, I think its outcome, my interpretation is that it was always a foregone conclusion, that it wasn't going anywhere because there were too many agencies and local people allied against it. It made for some strange uh, political bedfellows. Some um, environmentalists made common cause with Asheville businessmen who wanted to, to see this happen. And, and local people made common calls with the Forest Service for a little while. Um, so, but uh, to, the answer to your question is I don't see it being revived, not now. I mean, there, there would be a, a huge amount at stake in terms of the development that's gone on there since the 1970s. Um, so I don't, I don't think so. But you're quite right. That was a, that was a controversy, and I'll get to that. Um, I, I read some of the studies the Forest Service did um, when that park proposal was made, and they were very careful in the official studies never to take a position, but my sense from reading what they were writing was that this area is working just fine as it is. And if you think about it, the state park is run pretty much like a national park, only it's a, it's a day site, you know. I mean, you go up there, you drive up, you go to Mitchell's grave, you climb the tower, eat lunch in the restaurant if you want, buy a t-shirt with a red-tailed hawk on it, and you know, come down. Um, some people go backpacking, People like me walk around there, but it's pretty much run like a national park. Even the architecture is like a national park. So, uh, yeah, one more question here. Um, I'm just curious to you know if you have like a, a favorite place that, that you found while you were doing all this research in media. One of the favorite things that you experienced or happened to you? Were yes, it's a it's the last scene in the book. In fact, it, it sets up the. What? I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, there's a place, there's a place that's going to remain nameless here. And, and um, I, uh, in fact, you'll find, if you read the book, you'll find some of my descriptions are at, at times intentionally vague. I'll allude to certain spots, but not, you know, I'd, like everybody else, I don't want to see what I do contribute to the problem. But there is a spot, it's, uh, it, it's, it's very high up on a tributary to the South Toe River, and that's all you're going to get from me. Um, it's a spot right where um, the, you cross sort of from the Appalachian hardwood forest into what's called the northern hardwood forest, where you start to get into to birch and uh, beech and these other trees, and a lot of hemlock. And um, it's a very small stream. spills right off the top of, of the blacks uh, in a long series of plunge pools and rapids. And um, I go there to fish, and I make it a habit to be there um, on or near the summer solstice, because it's the longest day of the year. And I know of no better place to, to pass the longest day of the year than there. Now, sometimes I make it right on the solstice, and sometimes I'm a day or two off, but I make it a habit to be there. And um, the scene in the book, I was there one day, and um, fishing, as usual, and uh, a, a bobcat strolled across a, a fallen hemlock tree there just as casually as if I weren't there. And that really helped me kind of write the conclusion to the book because it pointed out again that nature and the Black Mountains always have these ways of surprising us. And no matter what you think, and I could walk around that place, it was logged to within an inch of its life. It's not old growth forest. It's, you can tell it's been cut over. There's all kinds of signs of human influence there. But it retains that essential element of unpredictability, of wildness, not wilderness, but wildness. I'll use a, a popular distinction in our field. And um, it draws me back year after year. And as long as my knees hold out, you know, I will I'll go back there um, on or near the summer solstice. And that's, uh, that's you know, my, my place. 
And that's all you're going to get from me. So, <laughs> thank you. Great time.